Um, they, they did fly into the building, of course, they did. And they could have been on automatic pilot, that makes sense. Um, we know that there was a heightened GPS and heightened cell phone activity um, that, that is very unusual. Uh, usually the, the GPS only works to, uh, it doesn't work at certain altitudes. And at a scale of like 1 to 10, the GPS signal was working at a 10, whereas ordinarily it might work at a 4. See? And so something was helping boost, and, and it had to be boosted. It, could not have, it couldn't have just spontaneously done this on its own. Something had to be boosting the GPS signal. And, that's, and it's just a, a matter of scientific requirement that it had to be boosted, and it was. Um, the cell phone was the same thing. I, you know, some people have tried to say that the cell phone conversations did not happen. I do believe they did happen. I do believe that people got through to their, their spouses. But again, you see that it had to be some, uh, there had to be some, 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 some technological boost for it to be done. And I think that they got, the hijackers got a lot of help. They got a lot of help. Uh, oh. My general view, and this is sort of what I'm asking, is uh, I, that's what I thought actually happened, was it was both you know, the planes and the demolition bomb. Yeah. Uh, but without a lot of information, that's just what seemed to make sense. What, uh, if you consider, the problems I'm having, if you consider books like Russ Baker's Family Secrets, yeah. yes. uh, Annie Jacobson's Area 51, that yes. just came out recently. Okay. And the last one I just read was uh, Naomi Wolf's uh, The End of America. Yes. And, um, Good, yeah. Well, I mean, it's just so random. So how can you expect us, uh, knowing the corruption uh, of moral character is what I believe what it is. I, I think fundamentally where we're at is a spiritual crisis, in, in essence, the big picture. Yeah. And so I'm sort of interested in you in, in, in part of that, because I, I'm sure there are people that are dedicated in the CIA that are very trustworthy. Well, you know? I mean, well, I'm trustworthy yeah. in the sense that their, their motivations are clear. But I think on, overall, considering all the torture and the long history that it's had, and you can't believe anything. Basically, you can't. You just don't know. There's so much spin with it. Yeah. You know, and I'm not saying there's not dedicated individuals. I think there are. I sure. I don't think everybody's sure. black and white. Sure. So, what I'd like to get from you in part is, is first of all, your picture of the, the big overall, what's What's the primary motive? You said the war, but who? I mean, what is the big picture? Who are the, the big honchos at the top that are mm -hmm. directing? Well, I, I, I'd like to answer this on a couple of levels. Um, first of all, uh, the CIA has a long track record of, of doing a false flag operations on itself. Um, and, and one of the reasons that I uh, may be more trustworthy is that I have a, uh, I was, uh, n I was an asset, not, an, not uh, a CIA director. My CIA handler received $13 million tax-free. Didn't even have to pay a dollar in taxes. Is that not the sweetest thing you've ever heard in your life? From the 9-11 investigation of emergency appropriations that were attended for the Iraq, Iraq to secure Iraq's cooperation. And he took the money, and you've never heard him speak, and he, when, when I was under indictment, my own CIA handler refused to speak to my attorneys for five years. If he had spoken to my attorneys at, one, at any time at all, we could have ended my indictment entirely. But the other thing is, is that I was, the reason you should trust me is because I paid for this. <laughs> I was locked up in prison on a military base for a year. And I was held under indictment for five years. And they were, so, the government was so, if you do a little research on my story, you'll find the government was so threatened by what I was going to say that they actually argued to for this is in the, this, this is like a record. There's a history of this. You can confirm this. They, they, they wanted to forcibly drug me with Haldol, Ativan, and Prozac, which would have chemically lobotomized me. 
because they said that I was, uh, they, they admitted that I was not hallucinating. I did not, do not suffer depression. Uh, for those of you who do suffer depression, sorry, but I don't. Um, I don't have mood disturbances. They said I had good eye contact. I was cooperative, smiling. There was, they could not identify anything wrong with me except that I argued that I had, that I, my defense was I had worked in anti-terrorism for nine years and I warned about 9-11 and my team warned about 9-11. And they were like, they were not, they, they, they tried to uh, detain me up to 10 years. They actually petitioned the court for the right on the Patriot Act for the right to detain me up to 10 years in prison with no trial and no hearing. Imagine that. The government is arguing that we don't have to give this woman a hearing. We can just lock her up indefinitely. And I was the test case on this, and it was horrible. And, and they wanted to for lock me up and forcibly drug me at the same time so that I would be so destroyed. They told the judge that they had no idea how long my cure, my cure was going to take, but they wanted it. Uh, the judge in my case was Michael Mukasey. Michael Mukasey later became U.S. Attorney General, and I fought so hard, and my beloved companion, sweet, wonderful Jay Fields, who, is, who died of cancer, unfortunately, never lived to see me exonerated. Uh, he fought in the blogs, and he fought on alternative radio, because the corporate media refused to cover my story. They would not, they didn't want to tell you what was going on. Um, they, they said that they, they implied very strongly that I was a religious maniac. And, and I do believe in God. And I have a spiritual life. Yes, I do. But I'm not, a, I'm not a religious maniac. I guess a religious maniac would be someone like the Elizabeth Smart uh, rapist, kidnapper, who went into court and was like spouting religious stuff and was singing up him standing up and singing hymns in court stuff like that they wanted me to yeah yeah it was and and when they when they realized that um the yeah when they, they there was actually a I, I call it my amnesty international moment uh they had already uh the the justice department had already petitioned to forcibly drug me and i was waiting for a decision and one morning i was in i was locked up in prison at this at this point uh, I had been held on Carswell Air Force Base for eight months, and then I was moved to the Metropolitan Correctional Center in New York for four months. And one morning, they, at 5.30 in the morning, I, the, the guard wakes me up, he shakes me, he said, you're going to court today. And I'm like weeping. I'm thinking that they've got the decision, and they're going to like send me back to Carswell to be drugged, and I'm hysterical. I was absolutely hysterical. And I get into the courtroom, and, and my, my, I'm in a holding cage that's about the size of this table. And they, and they come in, my attorney comes in, and he says, oh, my God, someone has started a blog on your case, and people are writing your judge. They're writing Judge Mukasey. You've got to tell your friend to stop doing this. I was like, never, no, <laughs> no way. And I was like, and I was like, we are, ne and literally I grabbed the bars. I was like, we are never going to stop. You are, we are going to fight to defend this Constitution. You are breaking the law. And we are never going to shut up until this is done. You, you can tell that crooked prosecutor that he can just go to hell because we're going to keep talking until, the, you know, you're never going to shut me up now. <laughs> you know, this was a mistake. <laughs> this was a huge mistake that they did this to me. Um, and we went in and the judge was like, you know, so. And at that point, the, uh, Jay had published psych records. When, when I, after my arrest, I had been ordered to have uh, attend, we, this actually saved me. Uh, I, I had been ordered to attend weekly psychology meetings. Uh, I had never had any psychological problems, and I had a year's worth of documentation saying that I suffered no mental illness, no depression, no psychosis, no mania, no nothing, no mood disturbances. And, and these are in the back of my book, so you can actually look at this stuff for yourself, and you can see the papers with your own eyes. And you can read them. And, and, he, and he, the judge was like, well, this is extraordinary. You're telling me this woman is incompetent and she's suffering from this grave mental illness, and yet she has the, all these records which are on the bloody Internet. Why are these papers not in my courtroom? And the judge was like, uh-uh, this is just not going to happen. And at that point, I was saved.
because the judge was like, this is, this is, this, you know, this is, this woman is not cooperative. You know, if I had been cooperative, you know, they would have done it. If I had been passive, they would have done it. But I mean, I'm a fighter and they still wouldn't give me a hearing. And I mean, I know how to fight. I'm an activist and an asset. Believe me, I know how to fight. And they would, and it was like the Patriot Act was so hideous, so big, so powerful that there, there was nothing that they were going to let it break through. But Judge Mukasey also did the financial case on the 9-11, the insurance claims for 9-11, for Larry Silverstein, who went to his synagogue. They both attend the same synagogue. Yeah. Cozy. Cozy. Very cozy. Did Muhammad Atta willingly sacrifice himself, or didn't he know what was going to happen to him? I do not know. I do not know. If, see, I wonder about all these things, because I wonder if they thought that it was like a, a practice, or if they thought, you know, they, this was just like, I, I, don't, I do not know the answer to that. It's like, it's fascinating to think what they must have thought. Uh, many of the, uh, there, were, there were foreign newspapers that reported that uh, many of the hijackers are still alive. Yes. Um, I think six or seven of them were reported. One is a pilot for the um, Saudi Arabian Airlines. I believe one lives in Los Angeles. Um, so there was all this, and then there was the report That's that true. Mohammed. Yes. Uh, so so it doesn't make sense that there were these hijackers that hijacked pla hijacked planes. I mean, obviously something is wrong with this story. Yeah. If these people are still alive. I well, I wonder though if it was those. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't have, as an asset, um, this may frustrate, this is probably going to frustrate you. I'm trained to stop where I, like I have, it's very much compartmentalized. And there are certain things that I know from my own direct personal experience that I can tell you. And then there are other things that I, I'm taught just to say, to draw a line. And it may drive you crazy. But there are some things that I cannot answer because I don't know. And as an asset, I'm told to stop. And to always to distinguish what I actually know from what I don't know. And that's one of the things I don't know. Sorry. Well, but, but I do believe there were hijackings. But if they hold on to the story that there were hijackings. Well, I, I, and then I have do the believe. the hijackers alive. I don't know. Well, but, but, the, but do we don't necessarily know who the hijackers we were. We also have other information that some of the serial numbers of the planes were um, uh, located several years later as the planes are still in existence. So there's, there's a lot of, like, very, very strange. Very strange. There's a lot of strange. And then, then yeah, that yeah. plane that went down in Pennsylvania with no plane parts. That was no shot down. No plane parts yeah. anywhere. There, there was a plane that was shot down, and I know that the, there was a pilot who shot down one of the airplanes, and uh, he is locked up in prison in Florida right now. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I, I, I could get it for you. I will get it for you. Uh, I've been. I'm sorry. I've been told his name before, and I'm actually doing a radio interview with Michael Herzog tomorrow, who's the one who told me about the guy. And I will get that information, and I will get, pass it to uh, our friend over here, and, and we'll get that to you because he needs help. The last I heard, he was still in. Uh, he, it could be that I hope he's been released. But the last, and, if he, and he may have been released by now, but the last I heard he was still in prison, and if he is still in prison, it'd be awfully nice if you guys could help him. Who's, who's to gain, who's to lose? Well, I, I believe, I mean, the, the tragedy was that it was so, it, it, before 9-11 ever happened, they already knew about this peace framework, and they already knew that they could have the United States would receive no punishments at all uh, for, or no punishments, they, they, very, they, they would, not, would not face any problems because of the years of support for the sanctions. The Iraqis wanted the sanctions off so badly that they were going to give the United States everything that they could have wanted. So this is even going on before 9-11 happens. And they were going to give them, you know, one million American-made automobiles every year, uh, telecommunications, that would be satellites, phone, TV, every, you know, the, the CIA could have been, you know, snooping through all the Middle East phone conversations. It was crazy.